Excellent. Thank you. So I would also echo my colleagues' um, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, and fantastic uh, job, Alexis, kicking us off. Very visionary um, and also really great to hear the history um, from that perspective. What I want to do today is talk about the future. Now, the future of GitOps is going to be different for every individual. Um, for many of you, the future of GitOps is uh, already here. Um, and But for most of you, it's very likely that you are um, just getting started. So hopefully we're going to uh, uh, address kind of the wide range of, of future of GitOps. So to start, I want to talk about once we came. And uh, Alexis alluded to this a little bit just a moment ago, which is if we start looking at it from a continuous integration perspective, this is something that's been quite mature for some time. Um, it's been at least probably 10 or 20 years where we've started to realize that the more automation that we put into our development process, the better. And we realized all sorts of benefits. Developers were able to get more productive. They were able to more quickly get code um, uh, tested and, and eventually ready for production. But the eventually ready for production didn't actually get us all the way to production. So let's take a look at that first process, that continuous integration process, and we'll see how that dovetails and how it actually extends out into GitOps and continuous operations. So that CI process really started here, which is that we had a developer or a DevOps engineer really more the developer, who was checking in their source code into Git, and that very well-known CI process kicked off. More recently, that CI process didn't just create a jar file or some artifacts there, but it's now increasingly creating uh, images, container images. So that's something that's been a little bit more recent. And those are getting dropped into some type of an artifact repository, like in this case, Harbor or Docker Hub or something like that. Now, if we look at this from the developer perspective and we add on that DevOps engineer, because they're already familiar with some of these tools, namely things like Git, it was a natural extension to say, well, you know what? To start getting toward operations, let's add this idea of application configuration also being checked into Git. Now, this was partially helped along by Kubernetes because Kubernetes brought this very important concept which was this concept of declarative configuration. So rather than running scripts to set things up, we just declared what we wanted set up. So we had this new ingredient that just really emerged in the last five years or so. So the key element here is that we have that declarative configuration, which is versioned in Git, and I'll talk more about that in this talk and later on and tomorrow as well. And we have the images that are stored in the repository. Now, this is an entire description of a complete set. And what we've done then is that we said, oh, well, given that I've got that entire description of my entire system, we can now deliver that into the runtime, which in this particular case is Kubernetes. And I already mentioned that Kubernetes, because they brought this declarative configuration, and they also brought a very important thing, which are these controllers, these Kubernetes controllers that are constantly keeping things in that desired state. Alexis referred to that as well. Um, this was something that we actually kind of inherited with this um, new technology that had emerged. So there's some familiar technology here from the developer perspective. There's the Git and being able to extend that to configuration. There's some of the newer technology of Kubernetes and controllers, and we glued some of these pieces together. And so that's what we ended up with here, is that we said, well, our entire system is described declaratively. Then we version that in Kubernetes, I am sorry, in GitHub, and then we deploy it to Kubernetes where there's reconcilers that are keeping that going. So based on that graphic that I showed you on the previous slide, we were tempted to take this, which was the continuous integration process, and we were tempted, 
to just do this and insert deployment as a part of that continuous integration process. But again, as Alexis alluded to, continuous integration is not continuous delivery, deployment, or continuous operations. There's a number of things, reasons for keeping this distinct from CI, and that is in many regulated environments, we need to have a separate, separation of concerns. So the developers are releasing, the operators are deploying. We might have many, many deployment environments, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit, or we might want to recreate a deployment, but we don't want to have to create a new build to do that. So the whole point is that while GitOps at a very high level makes us think, well, as soon as I've checked something into Git, I'm going to go ahead and do that delivery and everything will roll out. The point that I'm making here is that GitOps, in fact, is not Git delivery. What GitOps is really doing, is it's starting with the delivery process and extends beyond that. So rather than this picture, what we want to do is we want to keep deployment pulled away from the continuous integration process. And it's not just the deployment, it's the operations as well. Tying back to what Alexis was talking about earlier, it's having that operational loop and having it draw from the uh, declarative configuration that's sitting in Git. So we're gonna extend deployment to include operations as well. Now, a slightly more uh, graphical view of that shows you this. It shows you that on the left-hand side, we've got this continuous integration loop, and on the right-hand side, we have the continuous operations loop. Now, join me tomorrow in the lengthier session where we'll go into more into the details of that orange cycle on the right-hand side. But if we take that view and we come back to here, these are the things that we kind of got for free. And so again, we had YAML and we had these software agents that came from Kubernetes and we had been using things like Git for quite some time, for at least, I believe, 10 or 15 years. I think we just celebrated the 15 year anniversary of Git. What we did when we added GitOps is that we pulled this apart and we inserted something that was there to connect the continuous integration process with the continuous operations process. So what we did was we connected cloud native development with cloud native operations. And so here, what we've done is not just started with three plus one and equals four. It's the proverbial, we started with three things we got for free. We added this insight, which is the insight that Alexis was alluding to earlier, which is this pull-based model of pulling from those Git repositories and bringing that into the operational system so that we can closely integrate with those control loops. With that, we created GitOps. Now, the principles of GitOps, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those here because I want to talk a little bit more about how this is extending beyond where we came from. And by the way, I would say that this is what GitOps is for a great number of individuals. We started talking about GitOps as a solution to doing cloud native software deployments onto Kubernetes. And those cloud native software deployments were described with the very entities that Kubernetes made available, things like deployments and daemon sets and services and replica sets. And then we of course deployed it into Kubernetes. But on this slide, I'm pointing out that these are principles. They're principles, not technologies. And so what we're going to do is um, start to dive into applying those principles and expanding your view on the technologies that can adhere to those principles. So again, the principles are declarative configuration versioned in Git. We've got that automatic pull into the operational system. And then the operational system has a number of agents that are keeping things in line. So if we then take a look at those things, let's see how this expands. So this is really where for many of you, we're getting into the future. And that is 
Can we go beyond YAML? The answer is absolutely. Do you want to use TypeScript or Python to describe your systems? And we have things like CDKs, which is a, or JK Config, which is an open source project that we create here at Weaveworks that allows you to use some of these other languages to express your declarative configurations. The point here is that YAML, while that is the internal language of the Kubernetes system, that might not be the best language for the developer or the DevOps engineer to describe their configurations. Now, in terms of where we store things, we've been talking about Git. And some people think that GitOps means that you're constrained to only storing things in Git. Well, we've already seen that in GitOps today, even for application configurations, we're not only storing things in Git, we're also storing those images in a container registry, like Harbor or Docker Hub or Artifactory and any of those types of things. But what if we extend that even further into some of the operational systems that you have today? Something like ServiceNow that you might be using for configuration management. Are we saying that you need to throw out all of your existing enterprise systems to be able to do GitOps? Absolutely not. Now, join me tomorrow where we're gonna talk about what some of the requirements are on these systems, because at the top you see there that it says versioned. And in fact, even today, in just a moment, we're gonna start talking a little bit more about those versioning requirements. Git, uh, GitHub has them and Git in general has them built in. How do we um, deliver those same requirements around versioning, history and immutability in some of these other systems? That's where it gets very interesting. That's where GitOps, where we're pushing the envelope from GitOps. And then finally, on the target side, where today you might be targeting Kubernetes because you've got those replica set controllers and those deployment controllers, we can extend those targets beyond that to include things like the cloud, uh, bare metal, and many, many other environments. So what this allows me to do when I expand that view and start talking about some other technologies that deliver on those principles of GitOps, that allows me to do something really interesting. That means that I can GitOps not only cloud native applications, but I can GitOps my infrastructure. It's not even just my Kubernetes clusters, but my infrastructure itself, I can GitOps that, which means that I can get repeatability. I can get ops things that are delivered to content delivery networks. I can get ops things that go on, configuration for identity providers. How about chaos experiments? If I start describing my chaos experiments declaratively, and then I can decide when I want to deploy those things and see exactly which chaos experiments I had on certain days, that gets interesting as well. And of course, I can get ops my Kubernetes clusters. And we're doing a great deal of that already with many of um, many other organizations out there. WeaveWorks is working with those and so much more. The reality is that you can get ops just about anything. So what I like to say is that earlier I showed you that get ops is not equal to Git delivery. The way that I like to think about get ops is that it's equal to continuous delivery and continuous operations. So in other words, GitOps is equal to CD plus CO plus even some requirements on CI. I'm not implying that we're replacing CI, but we'll talk over the next couple of days about some of the requirements that this places on CI, but that's a whole nother talk. So before I wrap things up, I just wanna summarize by saying that today, this might be your view of GitOps, is that we're using Git, we're using something like Flux, and we're using, uh, using those tools to deploy things to Kubernetes. The future is all about scale. Where are we scaling? 
well, we're scaling in the number of sources and the number of things that developers and DevOps engineers can use to express their deployments. We're scaling in the number of target environments that we can deploy to. We're also scaling in the sheer numbers of deployments. So many of you have already perhaps started to uh, find some of these issues where uh, it's easy to do GitOps for two applications, 10 applications. But when I start to have 100 clusters and 300 applications de deployed across a dozen different sites that are cloud and on-prem, different Kubernetes and so on, then that scale becomes a challenge. So we need to put things in place. And this is where GitOps is starting to push as well. And then in terms of topologies, we've been starting at the data center, but we're increasingly moving out to the edge. And again, referring back to what Alexis has talked about when he talked about pulling things, the pull model that allows us to have these GitOps processes running in every single Starbucks or Walmart location or Chick-fil-A or any of those locations. And it allows us to have those GitOps processes operating in a distributed manner. And talk about distributed, what about cell towers? What about that level of distribution where we actually have them as you're driving down the highway every few miles? So I invite you to join us for the rest of today and the next few days. Here are some of the folks who are going to be sharing their stories. These are the folks where that what might be a future of GitOps for you is GitOps today for them. And they're gonna share a lot of great stories. So thank you very much. And Tom, back to you. Yeah.